the two. Hi, my name is Daniel Gill, and for Frank Morris tonight. Our guest is Paul Nemzer, who works as a lawyer for the Goodwin Proctor firm and who is also a published poet. He won the New American Poetry Prize for his book, Tetragrammaton, which was published oh, in Taurus. 2013. Or Taurus, right. Um, <clears throat> so hi, Paul, how are you doing tonight? Great, Daniel, thank you. Okay, so tonight we're gonna be going over some questions. Um, so, to get us off, uh, how did you get into working as a lawyer? Well, I had gone to Columbia to uh, graduate school mm -hmm. in the writing program there, and I had been studying poetry. And my year, nobody in my class had found academic work. There had been a drying up of the job market. Mm -hmm. And I went in for my exit interview to my teacher, who was Stanley Kunitz, who was a, a famous poet and uh, very renowned poet. someone who had won a lot of prizes and was a very wise man. Mm -hmm. He looked kind of like a biblical patriarch. <laughs> and I went in and I said to him, Stanley, I, I have no money. I have a lot of debts. I've been working in bookstores. None, none of us got a job. What should I do? Wow. And he looked up into the sky, literally for about a minute. And then he looked down at me and he had these huge <laughs> eyes and he said, the law. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was about a year after that I ended up going to law wow. school. Yeah, so it sounds like you really took his advice to heart, I feel like. Eventually, yeah. Yeah, if you're in that situation, I feel like you need to get, you need to get some <clears throat> kind of ball rolling. But yeah, um, I guess so we can go to another question now. Um, you practice law mostly as a litigator. True. Although I've heard that you've represented some people on death row. That's true, too. Um, so what was that like? Well, it's a very compelling kind of work. It's, it's really, um, it's the kind of work where somebody's life is at stake, so you don't want to yeah. get it wrong. You don't want to make a mistake. Exactly. You put a lot of extra energy. Every, every client's case is important to them, but nothing is more important than a death penalty case. Exactly. Um, it can wear you out, but it's, happily, I've never lost one and to see a client go free which I've had the experience of that mm -hmm. there's nothing that like that. That must be such an elevating experience there's there's really got to mm -hmm. be nothing like that especially yeah. and I'm sure for them as well. Yeah. So what kinds of clients did you have who were on death row? Well I, I've basically had two clients who were on death row plus I also was involved in the, the most recent uh, Massachusetts case which was in the 19. 80s that threw out the death penalty mm -hmm. here. Yeah. But in that one, I, I was uh, working with the Bar Association rather than with a specific client. So I, mm -hmm. I've had people who were, you know, charged with, convicted of uh, murder mm -hmm. uh, of one kind or another. And I made arguments that they should not be on death row and shouldn't get the death penalty. And in the, in the case of the second one, mm -hmm. uh, I actually made the argument that he should be free. Uh, and so we got the first one off death row mm -hmm. um, on the basis that he didn't intend to kill the person who died uh, in the event. Wow. And, <clears throat> and then the second person we got off entirely on the basis that uh, there hadn't been adequate representation of him with respect to the expert mm -hmm. testimony that had been given against him. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's gotta be such a stressful experience. It so was. What, what is it like talking in, in a courtroom, trying to co essentially see, tell these people to see the light, I guess, uh, tell them the truth. Um, well, you want them to understand things. that an injustice has been done. Exactly. And so the issue is, do you, how do you find a way to convince the judges that an injustice has been done, mm -hmm. and that it's a kind of an injustice that they can remedy? That's, I mean, that's gotta be fascinating. Yeah. And, I mean, as uh, working as a lawyer, um, this must be the kinds of stuff that you deal with all the time, presenting yourself in a courtroom <coughs> and essentially forming an argument. So how, how would you go about forming an argument? Um, well, it, it's actually got something to do with the same skills that are involved in writing poetry. It, it, yeah. you, you have to try to come up with a narrative, mm -hmm. a, a thread, a story that is going to persuade the court that uh, you're in the right. And so some of that is just understanding what, you know, what the human story is and, and creating a, a kind of human 
uh, wish on the judge's part to rule your way. Mm -hmm. um, so that's part of it. And then the other part is you have to uh, show that your position is, is the authentic one. And creating an authentic voice, that's actually something that happens in poetry, too. Right. Um, you're trying to create an authentic voice that persuades people that, that the poem is for real. Okay. And so those things are right. kind of uh, Something someone can relate to in terms of their humanity and whatever life experience have brought them to that point. Yeah, that's so. exactly right. Um, so again, so then you mentioned poetry. Um, uh, has your practice in law influenced your poetry in any way? Well, in the way that I just talked about. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I've learned something about making arguments. Right. And poetry often has an argument that, that certain poets even more than right. others. But uh, if, you, if you look at um, Shakespearean plays, mm -hmm. or if you look at uh, John Donne and, or somebody like that, the, there's often an argument being made there. Right. And so the, the two are related to each other. Yeah, you kind of have to follow that, um, I guess, structure in some ways. Yeah. Um, so now that we're on the topic of your poetry, um, what kinds of topics inspire your writing? You know, when well, you think it's, about sure. It, yeah. It's, uh, you know, everybody says poetry is about love and death. <laughs> but but uh, and everything in between and right? everything in between. But yeah. but if you think about it, that that covers an awful lot of ground because right. you have the love of being a child for your parents. You have mm -hmm. um, the love of uh, that when you fall in love, you know, with a partner. You mm -hmm. have uh, if you you're lucky enough to uh, have a child, then you have the parents' love mm -hmm. for the child. Um, and all of those kind of connections and your love for your friends and, and so there's a whole big range there and then the death part too. You're, you're exactly. worrying about your own mortality but also you experience uh, mortality of others and so all of that becomes subject matter for poetry. Yeah, these kinds of pivotal moments in your life that, you know, extremes on both ends. So extreme happiness, you know, those, those feelings of love that you have towards your parents and again the extreme feelings of loss when you experience death in some way. I mean, those are and those are all very provocative themes. And and that's what poetry's good at. Yeah. Right. I mean, you can say a lot of things very effectively mm -hmm. um, in ordinary life, mm -hmm. but to convey these powerful emotions, poetry I think is uniquely able to do that. Yeah. So what would set you know, poetry aside from, say, a book about love and death or something like that? Well, I think it's exactly that. I think it has to do with making you feel a particular way. Yeah. It, the issue of can, um, can the writing, number one, actually create the feelings of the body mm -hmm. in you? Because poetry is all about rhythmic language and powerful uh, language that kind of makes you feel in your body some of what's happening in, yeah. in the story. Um, and then the other part is that it, it touches your emotions in a unique way. Yeah. So that rhythmic language, I mean, so why is that a part of things that, you know, sound nice to the ear? You know, it's almost like when you hear a song, it has a good pentameter. Um, so, I mean, do you have any opinions on why you think that is? Well, I, I think it, it has to do with that uh, connecting with your own heartbeat, <laughs> yeah. connecting with the sound that you heard in the womb. Mm -hmm. I think it's the most basic kinds of things. I mean, we all want to dance if we can. Right. You know, you hear um, a certain song come on the radio. Everyone says, that's my jam. Something yeah, that's like right. That. And, and yeah. also, you know, you do things out in the world. Or you, hear, you hear a series of sounds yeah. that you associate with um, whatever the activity is the, right. or the experience, you know, you hear a bird or something like that. And poetry actually can sometimes mimic that. And so it, yeah. it makes you feel that stuff in an immediate way. Yeah. All right, so I guess we can get to another question. Um, so, again, we're on the topic of poetry. Um, which poets have influenced you the most, you know, living or dead? Um, <clears throat> well, I suppose... Um, in terms of, uh, I, I love old English ballads from, particularly from the Renaissance period, yeah. and those have been a big influence. Those are 
usually listed as anonymous, so yeah. I can't tell you who they were. But um, and I do like uh, other poetry from that period a lot. I like uh, yeah. um, people like Sir Thomas Wyatt and Dunn who write in a kind of a rough way. Um, yeah. So that's something I I've always liked and admired. I'm a great uh, fan of. Blake and Keats and Wordsworth and mm -hmm. Shelley, I, so I like the Romantics. Um, I'm a huge fan of Osip Mandelstam, the great Russian poet from the turn of the 20th century, mm -hmm. and who, who was murdered by Stalin in the yeah. 30s. Yeah. Um, I love Pablo Neruda's work and uh, Chilean poet and, and Cesar Vallejo, the great Peruvian poet. Mm. So those are, are uh, Examples, off a couple of years. and, and yeah. I, I'm very fond of uh, Asian poetry. I like yeah. a number of Chinese poets, like Du Fu and Levi, and Japanese poets, mm. <coughs> Muso Sasaki. So, any poems in specific that you can think of that have, I guess, kind of influenced your work or kind of guided them in one direction? Well, I don't know, but Sir Patrick that. Spence is a poem that I memorized when I was a kid and have gone back yeah. to a million times. Do you um, still remember it? Yeah, <laughs> can you I, I, can you recite it for us? I can recite part of it. The, <laughs> the king sits in Dumfrland town, drinking the blood red wine. Oh, where will I, good sailor, to sail this ship of mine? Up and spake an elder knight, sat in the king's richtney. Sir Patrick Spens is the best sailor that sails upon the sea. The mm. king wrote a braid letter and signed it with his hand, and sent it to Sir Patrick Spens, was walking on the strand. Goes on. It goes on. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then there's another one, a, a ballad called Thomas the Rhymer that I uh -huh. particularly love about a guy who uh, meets the queen of Elfland and is taken off with her to, uh, to Elfland where he's essentially kept captive there for many years and he comes back unable to lie, but he's a poet. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that makes for good poetry, right? Yeah. I guess art really <clears throat> comes from the truthful... Uh, right. expressions that we were talking about earlier. Right. So uh, those are just examples. There are a lot yeah. of poems. And I had amazing teachers. Um, I, I worked with yeah. Robert Lowell and Elizabeth Bishop uh, when I was uh, <coughs> in college and graduate school. And, yeah. and Mark Strand and Stanley Kunitz were huge influences. And I, I got to know them when I was at, at Columbia. Yeah. So those are just examples. Yeah, I mean, you've had a great education yourself. I mean. You went to BU for law school at Columbia University that you mentioned, and you got a bachelor's in arts from Harvard. Um, so do you have any teachers really specifically that you remember at those three well, institutions? Well, uh, I, I remember teachers in all of those, and they were important. Yeah. But in terms of poetry, the Stanley Kunitz was a huge influence on me, and he, yeah. he was... Uh, had the gift of uh, really helping you learn how to edit your own work. And in, mm. he was able to edit my work, and he did this with everybody, in a way which left it our own, yeah, that's rather really than changing it so that it was his. Exactly. So that was a remarkable and gift. I, I'm sure that that's got to be something tough for some people to do. When you see a poem that you want to, I guess, change, you're like, oh, you know, I want to change this word out here but it I when you do that enough it loses its kind of expression and that's right right like you said it becomes theirs um, so I guess we can go to another question then sure um, so how did how did you choose the uh, subject matter for the poetry books that have been published for example Taurus that uh, I brought it before and I got the name wrong unfortunately and then uh, Tetragrammaton so uh, Taurus which is the one that um, won the prize? Yeah, in twenty thirteen. I was in uh, I was in Saint Petersburg in Russia. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! And I was uh, I was there a couple of years in a row. One year mm -hmm. when my son was there, and I went to visit him. And then the next year, I was invited to come back to participate in a literary conference. And, yeah. And so I was living in Saint Petersburg for a few weeks, and. Um, what I learned being there was that it's a city that uh, <clears throat> it kind of feels like anything could happen there. It's wow. a city with lots of water. It's like Venice in that respect. A lot yeah. of canals and rivers go through it. And they've yeah. built these extraordinary buildings. It was created by Peter the Great 
um, in the 18th century, kind of out of nothing, out of a swamp. A lot of people died creating this, this city. Yeah. But they built these beautiful buildings right kind of on the water. And so it feels almost like a stage set. And it's a place which has inspired some um, people to, to write very phantasmagorical literature. The, the uh -huh. a poem which influenced me a lot in Taurus was uh, Pushkin's poem about the bronze horseman, the statue of Peter the Great, comes alive yeah. and goes yeah. into the city and does things. And then um, Gogol's uh, story, The Nose, in which a nose is cut off of a guy's face by his barber, and the nose wow. comes to life and goes take tries to take over his life in the city and is running around the city going to parties and everything like that. And, and St. Petersburg is the only city I know of where, where that could actually they have happen, right? a statue of a nose, <laughs> which when I was there the second time had been stolen, but I understand the, the statue. Oh, wow, it was the stolen. nose has come back. It's got that much fame that people just want to take it. Yeah, <laughs> right. And uh, so those that kind of background, that kind of a place, yeah. I, I felt like anything could happen. And I happened to be writing something when I was there. I, I, I'm a Taurus um, astrologically, and my wife mm -hmm. is also a Taurus, and she was in Boston, I was in St. Petersburg, and I yeah. started writing a poem about us being in two different places, but under the same constellation, because I had seen the constellation mm -hmm. in the sky yeah. um, when I was there. And <clears throat> then I looked up, who, who is this? bull Taurus that's in the constellation and it turned out it was the bull possessed by Zeus in the myth of Europa and yeah. I knew my wife had thought a lot about that myth and there's the famous painting of uh, Europa being abducted right. by the bull in the Gardner Museum Greek literature <clears throat> and uh, mm. but Titian's painting in the Gardner Museum here in Boston which is a really great painting yeah. And so I started expanding it, and it kind of took off. And I got the idea that this Taurus should be a bull gargoyle who's living a life in mm -hmm. the demi monde in St. Petersburg, and uh, it kind of went on from there. Yeah. So that's that book, and then the other book, uh, which has come out more recently, Tales of the Tetragrammaton. Mm -hmm. um, is this a picture? That's of a picture the, of my parents. Of your parents. Well, yeah. So you can just show um, that at the end. And so. Uh, <clears throat> It's, it's a book about my mom and mm -hmm. growing up in Portland, Oregon in the 1950s and 60s. And um, my mom's having a kind of personal relationship with God. Wow. And, uh, and it's, it's kind of... Uh, Is it very religious oriented? It, 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 I would say that it's kind of like Kafka meets... Uh, Sid Caesar, a comedian from the 1950s. It's a strange mix of religion and surrealism and uh, comedy. Well, strange is always good. Yeah, There's so no it's, it, this is a very strange book. Yeah. Um, but it's ultimately about my mom, um, what her life was like, and, and, mm -hmm. and her death as well. So I guess that's an example of one of your family members really influencing um, your life in that way in terms of your poetry. I mean, are there any uh, poems in specific that kind of captures the qualities of your mother and her life in Portland, I guess? Maybe this entire Well, the, the whole too. book is really about that. And it's, yeah. it, it would be hard to, to pick one uh, little little piece of it. But, yeah. but uh, the book is, it, it tries to get at, at kind of the strangeness of her perceptions. Mm -hmm. um, wow, that sounds really interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's that's what I was doing. Mm -hmm. so um, you grew up in Portland. I grew well, up in right? Portland. Yeah. So what was that like growing up in Portland? Well, it's funny because uh, I mean Portland's just as beautiful now as it was then. Yeah, although I, I visited last summer <clears throat> as we were we were talking in the car on the way over here. Yeah. And uh, Portland again is just a wonderful. It's a really fun city. Kind of feels like almost like uh, Harvard Square for everyone who lives in Cambridge. But um, when, I was a, when I was a kid, it didn't feel that way. Because mm -hmm. it wasn't, now it's kind of a, a young people's place. When I was growing up, it was less so. Yeah. Uh, but it was still really gorgeous physically. The, the, and, and it had a kind of mm -hmm. uh, spirit of independence and eccentricity mm -hmm. even, even back then. Um, How so? 
independence and eccentricity. Yeah. Well, Oregonians feel, I think, independent. They feel like they're maybe not quite part of, part of uh, the ordinary. Of the <laughs> and uh, yeah. and in, as far as eccentricity goes, uh, there was a fair amount of tolerance of of eccentric behavior in Portland then. Mm -hmm. But I think what's happened now is more young people have come in, there's amazing restaurants, there's yeah. a lot of uh, like music, art and lot music. Of funky and music. And yeah, lot of yeah, music. It's, it's just great walking around there. And yeah, it's, it's You can certainly moment. get a good cup of coffee there too. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so we'll go to another question. Okay. Um, so how have you balanced your careers as both a poet and a lawyer? Now, not essentially the idea that they've influenced each other, but how have you kind of been holding those two in, in both your hands at once almost? Well, I suppose the short answer is I don't sleep very much. <laughs> <laughs> the, the law is a very demanding <coughs> occupation, yeah. and so I, I have worked pretty hard throughout my uh, legal career. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also have found that there's time to write, and, and that being... Mm -hmm. Uh, limited in the amount of time that I have to write has forced me to focus and be intensive and be efficient about yeah. the writing that I do. So, um, you know, I've written all along during my legal career. About 10 years ago, I sort of said to myself, well, if you're ever going to write a book of poems and publish it, now's the time. Yeah. And so I became more focused and, and began to write even more. Um, which perhaps at the, was at the expense of my sleep even more. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good that you've been so inspired to keep up your work. Yeah. Um, so how many hours do you work on your poems? I mean, how, how much time have oh, you Oh, poems take a, a poem that I write takes uh, typically about a year to write. Really? Yeah. And I mean, obviously, I'm not working on it all the time. But right, right. But I need time to live with the poem and yeah. let it kind of... Uh, what does that mean to live with the poem? Well, it often means I write, I put it away. I write it to the, as far as I can get it, and then I usually find, although I typically like it more than it should be liked, <laughs> I, I've learned that, okay, put it aside and see if you like it as much in two right, weeks, and, and then see if you like it as weeks. much in you know, six months. Exactly. And, Just to try and get some perspective <clears throat> on it. And yeah. See if it's and and like somehow... That yeah. allows me to make them more complex and to make the uh, the imagery more interesting and mm -hmm. also uh, more, you could say, digested. It, it has to be lived yeah. experience that's in the poem, but it also has to be uh, be something that you've had a chance to process, yeah. let your unconscious process. Exactly. And, I mean, do you have any common themes that come up in a lot of your poems or something, some kind of imagery that you like to gravitate towards? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you can discuss here? Uh, I don't know. It, it, yeah. I'm not sure I could um, identify particular things. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, in Oregon, I grew up in situations where there was a lot of mist. In Oregon, yeah. there's a lot of mist. Yeah. And so you see partial views that's, of that's things. That's good imagery. Right? They're evanescent. Mm. So they, they're changing, they disappear, they reappear. Um, just the way a mountain, a big, the big mountains out west yeah. um, do the same thing. You know, sometimes they're out, sometimes they're not out, sometimes they're partially out. Yeah. And that whole experience of the, the change of things, the change of a perception, with the belief that behind them there's a truth, there's a mountain at the end of the time. Right. That's... That's an idea that recurs in my work in a lot of ways. Yeah. I mean, that's a very deep theme to explore, I guess. And there's a lot of instances in our life where something feels absent when it's really not there, or when, rather when it's really when there. When it's really there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, sometimes you just have to wait. Right, and then it'll just come with time. You know? Yeah. Um, but so then when it shows up, you have to seize that moment or you won't yeah, see it the just, next moment. <laughs> you're going to have to climb that mountain. Or yeah, exactly. Um, so um, let's get back to your career as a lawyer. Um, are there any significant accomplishments or significant moments? I mean, we talked about that moment when you got um, that client off of death row and that other client who was fortunately freed. Um, but are there any other moments in specific that you can remember or... Um, just the, some cases that you took on. Well, it's gratifying to win. 
<laughs> and when you win, and I think that goes across the board. Yeah, and that goes across people. the board. So when you win, yeah. it's, it's a good thing. But the most significant moments, I think, have been those in, in those cases where uh, so much was at stake, mm. and uh, the gratification of knowing that um, the terrible was not going to occur, your client exactly. was not going to be put to death, mm. and that justice would be served. Indeed. Say. Um, so we have two of your books here. Um, so with the time that we have left, because we're kind of drawing to a close here, uh, would you like to read any poems that are kind of sure. meaningful to you? Sure. Um, I have a few there on my iPad here. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> this poem is called After the Calm. I was uh, fortunate to uh, get commended in the British National Poetry Competition yeah. this year, and the, this poem right. was you the winning poem. That. You know, I searched so, for you, and that's, that's the first thing that popped up. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, on the website of the Poetry Society of the mm. UK, so after the calm. Our furniture is turning to nails' ends and cows' ears. We've stored no provisions for molassesless times. Like used up, riled up hives, our hearts, like pancakes burning in old butter, our backs. On the bus ride after the geriatrician, we smell angels powdering the breezes with lavender and sit down to dream and lie down to wake and wait to read the split nutshells in our pockets to predict that a sheep will dance with weevils and a salmon lay down with a leaning willow thinking someone always wants the rides nobody wants, which breaks our calm. Bus music jostles us like shifting tide, where islands once appeared upside down in the harbor, and the loudest movement